Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to give it just a moment to allow for any other participants to join us, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So hello. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Bobby Lynn Kekik, and I'm the director for New Student Programs. I have the wonderful pleasure of hosting our Falcon Live chat today, along with three of our campus experts who you'll be hearing from in just a little bit. Our Falcon Live chat today is entitled Living on Campus and Community Wellbeing and Safety. Regardless of whether your student is living on campus, we want to make sure that this is a chance for you to learn a little bit about the resources, our community, how they can really leverage and engage in this opportunity and make the most of the time that they have um, while they're joining our campus community. A few housekeeping tips. Our Falcon Live chat series is really an opportunity for us to bring a little bit of our resources and our campus to you regardless of where you are across the world. We are really lucky and fortunate that we have students and families who are joining us from all around. So um, with that, <laughs> while that is an incredible privilege for us, we know that it's hard to find a time that's going to work for everyone. So this session is being recorded and you would be able to view this at a later date. That might be a little bit more convenient for you. We will post this on our uh, Bentley Orientation YouTube site, and you are able to find that by searching Bentley Orientation YouTube or going to our website, which is bentley.edu slash orientation, and we have a direct link there, um, along with a variety of other resources. Um, throughout our time, we will cover a variety of different topic areas, but we do encourage you to ask questions questions throughout, whether that's using our chat feature or our Q&A box. Um, you can do so anonymously or you can ask it directly to us as well. Uh, if there is something that we're unable to get to during our time today, please feel free to reach out to us via email. At the end of our slide deck, we will have a contact slide, so you'll be able to uh, take a look there. But when in doubt, if you have a question, you can always reach out to our orientation team, which is the team that I oversee at orientation at bentley.edu. And we can connect you with any of the offices um, that you might have questions for. So we are going to go ahead and hear introductions from our wonderful panelists. Then we're going to speak a little bit about um, a quick overview of what your students are already interacting with, and then we'll go ahead and jump into our topic for the day. So I'm going to, to turn it over to John to introduce himself first. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is John Piga. I'm the Associate Dean for uh, Student Affairs here at Bentley, and I manage the housing, residence life, conduct and care teams. And I'll be telling you more about that uh, as my slides come up. And uh, now I'll hand it off to Michelle. Michelle. Well, thank you, John, and um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Bowdler. I am also an Associate Dean of Student Affairs overseeing our health center, counseling and community well-being and health promotion, as well as um, some resources for people who've experienced any form of sexual misconduct. And um, I'm really looking forward to telling you a little bit more about um, our services and answering any questions that you have. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Roach. I am the operations lieutenant for the police department here at Bentley. So that means I'm responsible for all of our patrol functions and um, investigations. Wonderful. So like I said, we have some wonderful campus experts and we're going to get to um, our topic in just a moment, but wanted to just share some insight into what your student um, is experiencing right now. So uh, once they've deposited, they have a whole slew of things that they need to complete. So wanted to share some of that information with you. 
know, I think it's really important to note that at Bentley, we really do view our families, our support people, our um, guardians as partners in this experience. We acknowledge that you've been with your student for many years up until this point, and you know, they don't just step on our campus and then all of that goes away. <laughs> we recognize that um, you are probably still going to be a confidant, someone that they are gonna come to. And so what we wanna do is really work with our families to provide some information and resources. So in the event that they do come to you, that you can help to guide them, direct them to some of those pieces. Now, believe me, we will have many student, faculty, staff that will be there sharing this information as well. But um, having you as that partner is, is really helpful. And I think blended with that is also this sense of self-advocacy. So how do we empower our students um, from us as staff doing this, but you know, again, in this partnership of really taking advantage, making the most of this experience. And, you know, if maybe they're not getting along with their roommate, then maybe it's nudging them to say, hey, why don't you connect with your RA? This is someone who can help to support you in that. Or, you know, you're not doing so great in that class. Your faculty members have office hours. They're a really great resource. So really trying to empower them to take advantage of this experience. Um, and we've found that doing this in partnership has been really um, effective. Again, we want to empower the students to, um, to take the lead and to do that work. Um, this is their experience, but we know that um, we know that they're going to come to you and we want to make sure that you have this information and resource as well. So a way to get started with that is to take a look at what they're currently doing. So now that they've deposited, they are starting to complete tasks in their new student checklist. Um, your student received, and you may have also received if we have your um, email address on file, our new student guide. This is a comprehensive guide that explains all of these tasks on the checklist and additional resources that are important for your student to be aware of as they, are, they begin their journey here at Bentley. That guide can also be found on our website that I referenced earlier, so please feel free to take a look at it if you haven't. It is a little bit longer of a document, but we really do encourage students and families to to take a look at that because it will help to answer any of those questions that you might have initially. Then when it comes to orientation, we believe in a tiered approach um, and really thinking about just-in-time information and not trying to overwhelm people. So we start with an online module, it's called Bentley Beginnings. It takes about 60 to 75 minutes max for um, someone to participate in, but this is a really great way to take a deeper dive into what are the resources, what are the expectations, responsibilities, and how can I really start my um, career at Bentley in a, in a positive path. And that is something as a family member, if you're interested in viewing that content, you're able to create a guest account and take a look at that content as well so that you would have that information. Another big component that your student is going to experience in the next few weeks and months um, is really this academic overview. How am I preparing for my course registration? So in a few weeks, your students will receive a link to an academic overview. This gives them insight into not only what are the courses that they should consider um, registering for, but how do they use the registration software? How do they access resources as they're crafting this, um, this schedule for themselves? Once we get into January, which is when course registration will take place, there'll be an opportunity for them to interact with advisors if that's something that they um, are interested in. And then again, they would participate in course registration. This is virtual, but the advisors are very accessible um, and able to connect with students in a way that is approachable and appropriate for them. Another few pieces, um, we also have virtual engagement. So if your student wants to meet some other peers and start to, to make those connections, we do have a variety of social opportunities. In a week, week and a half, we're going to be having a bingo event. Um, so please encourage them to take advantage of that. And also um, social media, we're incredibly active. If you are also on Instagram, uh, you can follow us at Welcome Falcons. There's a lot of resources, deadline information, and, um, and just ways to continue to support your student. And then we have our spring orientation. So that will take place starting on January 19th. And um, students will move in on that day if they're living on campus. And then they will participate in a program um, from Thursday until Sunday to really kickstart their experience at Bentley and make sure that they're feeling prepared 
to start their courses, to get involved and really make the most of this experience. So what do we have for our families? Well, you are already taking advantage of one of the resources that we have, which is our Falcon Live Chat series. We will host another one next week on funding and financing your students' education and whether that is something that you are helping the students to navigate, um, whether you are helping to pay for that or you're helping them navigate that. There's a lot of great resources. So highly encourage families to join us for that. And then we'll host another um, live chat in January, where we'll speak a little bit more to community engagement, involvement, and again, ways to really make the most of this experience. Additionally, we have that online orientation that you're welcome to take advantage of. And we do have a student affairs video series. So this, this is in, encompasses the different offices that are going to be there to support your student that is available on our website. So again, as you are looking for information, as you're starting to build this kind of toolbox of resources to support your student, these are great ways to, um, to just fill, fill that up. One last plug is that um, for families who might be joining their student on move-in day, please do. Uh, we invite you to join us. We'll have a vendor fair and a small reception, and then the students will engage in their programming beyond that. But what we do offer is a virtual workshop for all family members following orientation as a way to give you some insight into what that experience was to talk about some of our focus areas and how we support students both in and out of the classroom. And then we always end it with a student panel. So that way you're able to connect with current students. Um, and would always say, if you are looking to connect with the community more and engage, we do have an office of alumni and um, family engagement that will provide a variety of events and opportunities. But one of our signature events is our Falcon Weekend, which occurs every fall semester. And it's a way for us to bring families, alumni, current students, faculty, staff together. Um, and just it's a really great university tradition. So if you find yourself available in the fall of 2023, we would love for you to join us for that event. So now that we've had an opportunity to give you some insight into what your student is experiencing, some of the resources that you have access to over the next few weeks and months, I want to go ahead and dig into the topic of our live chat series. So I am going to um, pass this along to our campus experts. These are the three topics that we'll be hitting on today, living on campus, um, conduct and care, community well-being, and campus safety. So I'm gonna turn it over to John to get started. Well, thank you, BL. Uh, I guess I'll begin by uh, referencing my own uh, experience with January move-ins and, and the beginnings of a, an academic experience in January. Uh, personally, I started in, in a January term, and then when I transferred, I also, uh, once again, started in a January term. So we'll be moving in uh, in the middle of New England winter, wherever you're coming from, but I guarantee you that there will be, as BL referenced, many, many things for your students to do and for you to do once you get here as well, whether those are uh, athletic events or other student community events. Uh, there will be no lack of opportunities for your students to engage. And I sit here telling you that I'm living proof that it can be successful and it can be wonderful. And I am confident that for your student, the experience will be uh, great as well. Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, let me talk a little bit about the residential spaces that we offer here at Bentley for those of you that will be living on campus. We have three uh, specific types of housing. We have uh, residence halls, which may sound general to you, but are specific to us. Those are um, uh, communal living situations wherein generally we have a straight floor with singles and doubles off of each side of the floor. Uh, the bathrooms are shared. Generally, that's where first year students end up. Um, it's a way for them to get to know one another. It's a way to, for them to feel a sense of community and commonality almost immediately. Uh, think of it as almost an urban environment where it is almost difficult to not interact with other people. Uh, so for first year students, or even for that matter, for any new students, those types of environments, uh, residence halls with communal bathrooms, double and single rooms off on each side, are the ones that uh, really promote uh, the most interaction. 
uh, generally in our community, uh, first year students go from that scenario into a suite style kind of scenario. Again, uh, in, in that configuration, you have uh, suites, which typically house anywhere from four to eight students, uh, generally four bedrooms to a suite, sometimes two, sometimes three double bedrooms or single bedrooms. They vary depending on the suite. Uh, these upperclassmen that generally live in these areas uh, have a common space as well. So you go into the suite, there's a living room, and then there are bedrooms off of that, off of that common space. There are kitchenettes and suites uh, and a number of bathrooms depending on the total occupancy of that particular suite. Uh, these suite style uh, buildings are spread throughout campus. Uh, and depending on where your student gets assigned, uh, you could be on lower campus, which is by our athletic fields, or on main campus, which is uh, right by the student center where the majority of the student population lives. The last type of housing that we have available are apartment style, uh, uh, apartment style accommodations, and those are exactly as suites with the exception of having full-fledged kitchens in them. So for students that live in uh, apartments, generally they're upperclassmen, they've developed a little bit more autonomy. They can actually cook for themselves, which is great. Um, and uh, they live a lifestyle that is almost akin to living in Boston or living in Alston. You can go into your apartment, cook your meals, uh, you have your own bathrooms, obviously. And generally people in their uh, group together, they know each other over the course of time. But if you're a transfer student that gets placed in, in an apartment, uh, you'll have plenty of help getting to know the people that you're living with from your RA to uh, your orientation leader. So it's residence halls, it's suites and apartments, and they're generally, if you wanna look at it this way, uh, greater iterations of autonomy as you go through uh, your experience here. In each of these settings, whether it's residence halls, suites, or Departments. We have residence life staff, and they are there to help students, to uh, connect with students whenever there are any concerns or advice is needed. These residence directors are full-time uh, live-on staff that manage the student staff that also live in these accommodations. So in every first-year area, there is an RA on each floor. Generally speaking, our ratio is um, right around 25 to 1. So it's the expectation that every RA know every student, uh, every student name. Uh, the students will have their name tags on their door when they come. So as to uh, indicate that we know who they are and that they are known to us, uh, each student is very important to us. And so the RAs are, are conduit to ensure that uh, there's a direct connection between the residential students and, and the professional staff that help support them. So RDs manage these RAs and RAs are spread throughout campus. There are 98 of them. Uh, as I indicated, the ratio is greater in the first year area, but they also exist in suites and apartments. And again, the expectation of the RAs is that they knock on doors, that they uh, get to know their residents and they help them as questions come along or as uh, issues arise. Would it be, if it would be negotiating with a, a roommate about uh, standards or about uh, any variety of topics. Um, RAs are there, and so are their residence directors. The RDs who live in the buildings they manage are supported and managed by a small central office staff that is situated in the student center, which is where I'm sitting right now and where BL sits across from me many times. Um, and we, uh, we work 9 to 5 or 8.30 to 4.30, and uh, we have meetings with students. We have meetings with residence directors. We have meetings with assistant directors too, who are part of the central office staff. We're also a resource for you, we're a resource for students. And together, uh, the, the entire network of staff, RAs, residence directors, central office staff, are here to really support and uh, encourage our students to their own successful ends. Um, sharing our office space with the central office staff is a conduct staff as well. And as you can imagine, in any community space, there are some rules and regulations. Some of them are pretty commonsensical, frankly. You know, you shouldn't be so loud as to bother the people next to you. Um, you should be attentive to other people's belongings. Um, and every once in a while, when, when these expectations are nudged or perhaps actually just violated, we do have a hearing system, a conduct system. 
those those hearings are generally managed through the residence life staff uh, for the more minor uh, uh, violations or alleged violations. As the as the allegations become more serious, with which we have very few, central office staff staff takes a role. At the upper end of the conduct process is a is a a, a process that involves faculty and students uh, and gives students the opportunity to speak to their own experiences and uh, put forth their own perspective on what took place. Um, these conduct boards are infrequent, uh, but if you wanted to as a parent and if a student were involved in that, you could also uh, be present for that as well. So the whole thing is intended to be an educational experience. It's not punitive. It's a conversation. It's uh, uh, hopefully a, a pathway to a greater understanding of what the expectations are either at the university or within a residence hall. And this entire premise of uh, teaching students uh, applies to care, which is the care team that is uh, next on my slide. Uh, the care network exists to receive um, reports or referrals for students who might be struggling in some way. And conduct itself is actually care infused. Uh, we are attentive to the idea that the students are uh, obviously it, their education matters a great, great deal to them. So uh, anytime that there's something that they're struggling with, uh, we reach out either to the student. Well, actually, both to the student and to the reporting party. You can you can submit a care report if you wanted to, if you were concerned that your student was somehow or other uh, not thriving. Uh, the care report is a is a public forum, so feel free to drop us a line if you would like or call us directly. Uh, the care team meets every week and uh, discusses students who have come up either through the reporting system or um, through residence life or through health and wellness or through uh, Michelle staff or sometimes through Jessica staff. And um, again, our goal with care and with conduct and with residence life and all the RAs and all the RDs and central office staff that we have in place is to help students navigate what can at times be a complex uh, uh, and, and confusing new system. And we're here to help. We hope to see you in January and we're looking forward to meeting your students. We're very excited about their arrival. And with that, I will turn it over to Michelle. Okay, well, thank you, John. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we mean when we say well-being. And um, I wanna invite any of you who are listening in, if you wanna put into the chat your own, when you think about well-being and when you think about your wishes for your student, um, please feel free to put something in there and we can always talk about it after. Also, if you have a question and you feel shy asking it after, you can put that in the chat as well. So I want to tell you just a little bit, some, some nuggets about our services that will matter for you and then um, be available uh, for any specific questions. I wanted to start by saying that the... Um, so there we are. We're going to talk about this in a minute, uh, but we'll have this up. It's okay. You can look at it while we're while we're talking about our services. Um, I wanted to mention that um, while our health and counseling centers are open from eight thirty to four thirty, there is after hours lines for both services. So that if a student at eight o'clock at night felt a little worse than they felt when they came in to see the health service and they're wondering, can I take Tylenol and then three hours later take Advil? They can call and get a little bit of advice on uh, something that they don't think can wait till the morning. I'll let Jessica talk a little bit about um, more of uh, emergent issues and, and, and the uh, uh, university police's role in that. But we do have after hours care. We also have a pharmacy that delivers directly to people's uh, dorm rooms if they want, residence halls, I think that's the right term now. And um, that's something that the health service can walk anybody through. The one thing I will recommend is that your student come with their insurance card back and front. It could be a paper copy, it could be just a, it could be on their phone, but 
while our services at health and counseling are free of charge, it's important that they have their insurance card if they need it for medication or a copay for a specialty visit off campus. And um, we have people here who, if they have a question about, you know, I don't know if something's in network, I'm supposed to go in network, how do I figure that out? We have people here who can help them with that. So they don't have to have everything all figured out. If they call you, great, but I just want you to know that they're not completely left to their own when they, when they arrive. There's so many people, as BL was saying, who wanna be helpful. Um, I, if anybody has questions about immunizations requirements or about COVID, I uh, confirmed with the health center director yesterday that what's required for COVID is the first series of vaccine and then one booster. And I know many of us have had several boosters since then, and that is uh, also uh, something that many people are taking advantage of, but for the requirement for coming on campus, it's at least one booster. Um, if you've had trouble getting immun any immunizations because they don't offer certain ones that are required uh, where you reside, we can help with that. It's not gonna keep somebody from coming on campus. Um, but they will probably get a call from the health center or John's office to just help make sure that's coordinated. The services uh, that we offer are, are not only free of charge, they are confidential. And um, I, I'm always happy to talk to parents about that. I think when they when you hear that, it can feel like what we're saying is that we won't talk to you. And I think what's important to differentiate is that Students will often say in the middle of a visit because they're feeling overwhelmed, they, they just found out they had a concussion and they're, they're not even necessarily retaining all of what's being said to them. And they might say, can, can you call my uh, parent? Can they listen in on some of this advice? Can I ask you to email them? And we absolutely will. And we just say it's confidential so that students know um, that they don't, they don't, that they can come in and decide at the time if they feel like they need some additional support from their parents or guardians. So I just wanted to uh, say that. Um, we have a robust uh, health, uh, health and well-being program uh, group who, you know, this is finals time coming up, and I just found out that they're putting up a big uh, unput together Lego set in the library, because sometimes when you're trying to, I know, isn't that a great deal? You know, sometimes you're trying to de-stress and you just need to get your head out of your studies. And even while you're in a study group, take 10 minutes and do something that's tactile or do some art or do a two minute meditation. And there's all kinds of those activities happening in the next couple of weeks. But there's a lot of work that's done to welcome students, explain services, talk about things like um, the importance of sleep and to uh, offer services for people who have questions about um, alcohol use, if they've had, uh, as John was talking about, that conduct is really there to support people, not to punish them. And I really love that frame that, you know, we remember our own college times when we did things that we now probably think, oh, gosh, I, you know, I don't want anybody to know that I, I did that, but not me, but everybody else. I'm just teasing. So, so, um, so as students sort of put their feet into um, making choices and sometimes feeling like they might need some support about the choices that they made. Um, they can come and talk to the health promotion people about, you know, what are some strategies to be able to participate in social life where there isn't drinking involved? Or, you know, I find that I'm not somebody who's comfortable. And, you know, there's a lot of strategies that are really um, about harm reduction. You walk around with a, 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 a cup at a party, nobody knows what's in it. And it doesn't mean that you don't, you can't go because you don't choose to drink. And so we really talk to people both about what they imagine is true about college life and what really is true. 
And actually what we find in the data and from student conversation is that most students will, re will respect other students' choices. And we need to make that information really well understood. And um, there are times when students have told friends that they're in recovery and they report back that students will say, well, I'm really glad you told me, what do you need to feel comfortable in this living environment? How can we support you? And it's really a very um, caring community in that way. So I just wanted to emphasize that. And now why don't we just move uh, quickly to this well-being slide. Um, so as you'll notice in some of my comments, uh, these are things that our, our group and I think many of my colleagues here think of when we think of community well-being, particularly for students starting in January, they may be anxious that you, everybody else has had, everybody else, but there's 90 of, of them who have not come in yet. Everybody else has made friends. Everybody else has found their, their niche. And in fact, that's not true. There are people who will tell you at orientation that sometimes it took second semester first year or even sophomore year when they started taking classes that were more in their major where they made a contact over a particular club where they really felt like their good friends uh, came to be. And so I just wanna remind everybody to be patient with that and um, know that they're not alone and that we try to do activities that foster connection. I'm gonna let Jessica talk a little bit more about how hard we work to make sure that people feel safe in their environment and um, offer ways to uh, help them when they don't. Um, it's really important that they know how and where to access support and that that access and that support is not just in one place. So that if somebody is feeling lonely, it doesn't mean they have to decide to go to the counseling center. They may have a mentor, they may have a faculty member, they might have somebody they've connected in, in some of the groups that they're part of, who they just want someone to listen and have them, or an RA, and to say, oh, gosh, I feel just less alone telling you and having you tell me how normative that is. And so, you know, it's important today that we really let you know that our resources are vast. Um, that we are working with students on accessible ways to de-stress, that those activities don't always cost money or involve joining uh, a group that you don't wanna join, but really that, that our programming um, is, is really uh, creative and interesting. And there are many, many things that people can choose from. And green spaces here are, are beautiful. And um, it's really easy to get a workout just from going up those stairs that are really tough at my age, but I do love it. And I try to do it at least every day. Um, and so that's about, and, and, and then these other things I've already talked about. So I, I, I welcome you. I wish you, I wish you the best. And, um, you know, while we're excited, if you're feeling a little nervous or anything that's happening, that's normal. And um, just be kind to yourself in the next few days and we'll see you soon. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jess Roach. Thanks, Michelle. I'll try to talk about, I'll tell you all about the police department as quickly as I can, because I wanna make sure you have time for questions at the end. Um, so we are a full-time police department, uh, much like the one in your city or town. Um, our, um, we are also an accredited department, which means that there's standards set by, um, the Commonwealth for um, best practices in policing. And so we meet those standards and then they come and check and make sure we've met them um, at least every three years. Um, we have 25 sworn officers in the department um, and sworn in this case means that they are fully academy trained, um, certified by Massachusetts as police officers. Um, so, Chief Bourgeois um, is the chief of the department. It runs the whole department. Uh, and then we have two lieutenants, myself and an administrative lieutenant, um, eight sergeants, six of whom are patrol sergeants. So they're out on the street um, in the cruiser, making sure everyone else is, is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, one uh, detective sergeant who's responsible for all of our investigations. And then one um, training and emergency preparedness sergeant. He's got a really long title, I think that's it. Um, and then 14 police officers, um, most assigned to patrol, but one is in the uh, detective's office 
doing investigations with the detective sergeant and one is responsible for our accreditation. Um, in addition to regular training that everyone gets, there's also uh, many specialized training areas for our officers, um, things like crisis intervention. Um, so how to talk to people who are in crisis, um, other things like sexual assault investigations. We have people specifically trained for things like that. Um, different patrol functions like patrolling on a bicycle or on a motorcycle, um, they have specialized training for those things. And then we have a lot of instructors in different disciplines. So um, some of those that would apply to your students would be um, the RAD program, which is a women's self-defense class or um, teaching CPR and first aid to students on campus. Um, and then for our non-sworn people, we have six dispatchers who sit and answer the phones and tell everyone else where to go. Um, five security officers, um, some part-time, some full-time, but their responsibilities are things like um, unlocking doors for people who are locked out or transporting students who are on crutches because they were injured somehow. Um, so transporting them from their dorm to the classroom buildings and then back to their dorm at the, at the end of their day. Um, so we let our security officers do things like that. Three administrators, um, and then everyone's favorite police employee is our comfort dog, Blue. Deal. Yeah. He's got his own slide. There he is. Blue is a black lab. Um, he is a trained comfort dog. He's about three years old now. Um, he lives with one of our sergeants, um, so can use him to work every day with him. Um, he works at least 40 hours a week, um, and his job is to do, to uh, make people feel better. Um, it's amazing how him entering a room changes the, the atmosphere in that space. Um, so he helps us with community engagement functions, um, and, and helps out with, um, on calls, like he goes to just regular, whatever whatever Sergeant Barkas is going to for calls, Blue goes with him. Um, and then, so because of that, in, that community engagement um, function, it's one of our, it's, I wanna say it's our priority. It's after safety, engagement comes next. Um, we wanna be a part of the community. Um, we do a whole lot of different functions, um, but everything from this last year we've done, um, a kickball game with one of our student groups. Um, we won. Um, we've served breakfast by moonlight. So um, it's an event that happens during finals every year. Students um, will study all day and then come get breakfast at like nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night um, to um, creating programs about um, for students about avoiding scams, things like that. Um, these pictures are um, Chief Bujar putting up the pride flag for um, Pride Month. Um, Lieutenant Wade driving around um, Bentley's mascot Flex in our UTV. Um, Chief and one of our brand new officers, that was the day that Officer Ramos graduated from the academy and his award for the highest academic achievement in that class. Um, and then the last one is um, Detective Camacho and uh, Sergeant Micho who saved a turkey the week before Thanksgiving. Um, he, the poor turkey flew into a building, um, got trapped inside. Um, and so they had to go rescue him and save him from the building. No injuries, the turkey and the people are all fine. Um, to answer a couple of your questions before you have the opportunity to ask them, we do have um, over 400 phones on campus, emergency phones. Um, some of those are the blue lights that you've seen here and at other places. Um, and then some of them are little boxes on a wall that you push in our, in our um, residential halls that you push one button and it connects you automatically to our dispatcher. Um, we also have the Rave Guardian app, which is a um, app that you download onto your phone and it allows um, you to have direct access or a phone and text access to our dispatcher. Um, and there are also more than 300 cameras on campus that monitor um, the exterior doors to our residence halls and some other places like on poles and parking lots, things like that. Um, those are monitored in our dispatch center. Um, they are live on the, on the screens in there um, and they are recorded so that we could go back if 
if there wasn't someone watching at that particular time and we needed to see something. I think that's it. Cool. All right, so thank you so much for sharing all of that information. I want to make sure that um, while this was very comprehensive, that we're able to get to any questions that our family members may have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment so that you're able to see all of us and the panelists, and we'll go ahead and get to any of those questions that you may have. And then prior to wrapping up, I will share one more screen with our contact information for our offices and our functional areas. So if there are some additional questions that you think of, um, whether you're watching this as a recording or um, once you leave this live session, please feel free to reach out to us. And as I mentioned, um, when in doubt, if you're not sure which office to reach out to, you can always connect with my team at orientation at bentley.edu. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, if you do have any questions, the chat is available and open now. Um, you can either post it in the chat or message one of us directly. The other option is there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you can go ahead and click that button and type it in anonymously, and we'd be happy to answer it. And I saw you unmute yourself. Do you have any words of wisdom or pieces that you wanted to join in there? <laughs> I, uh, we have a question. Ah, we do. Yes. And it's actually for you. So this is great. Um, it says, do students choose their housing um, first come first serve or is it assigned upon completion of housing information? So uh, students in the January term do not choose their housing. They will be placed in, um, they'll have some preferences that they can put in, but they'll be placed in our available spaces. Uh, that information should be coming your way the week of December 19th, I believe. And if it doesn't, please send an email to, certainly to BL, but to GA housing at bentley.edu. Uh, that's monitored daily. Um, yeah, every attempt is made to satisfy whatever student requests there are. Um, so uh, I guess I'll, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and I'll just add to that too, because I think sometimes people ask, um, you know, what does that look like beyond my first time at Bentley? And once your student navigates through that first, um, for this, for, for January, it would be through that first semester they're able to participate in a much broader housing selection process where they're able to um, either select a roommate that they, um, someone they've met or someone that might be looking for a roommate. Um, and it's a much more robust process where you're able to make some of those selections. Um, but to John's point, for any new student, we do, we do place them. In fact, they will, your students will arrive uh, and housing selection will be literally really like two weeks around the corner, they'll get a, a bunch of information about how to go through it. Uh, they'll get some help as to uh, how to group and if they want to select as a group. Uh, and at that point, as BL indicated, um, the entire inventory will be available based on class standing uh, generally. And so seniors get to select first, then juniors, then sophomores. Mm -hmm. And then we place the freshman class as they arrive in, in May and June and July. Yes, and there was a follow-up about roommates. So as John mentioned, um, your student should have access right now to complete their housing contract and application. And within that application, there is um, information around the preferences that he mentioned. But also if your student does know somebody coming in, you can put that information in there. Again, it's not guaranteed, um, but you can put that information in there. I will say, and John, please correct me if I'm wrong, but nine times out of 10, um, students actually are really grateful that they were able to go in and be paired with someone they didn't know because it allows them to expand that network, even if they knew somebody coming in. Um, and then, of course, as John referenced, there's wonderful staff from the RAs, the RDs, the assistant directors who can help um, 
navigate any things that might come up if you don't select your roommate. So please know that it does really work. Um, even if your student is placed with someone that they don't know, it, it really does work out for them. Yeah, I, it's a strange thing and it, it might be about our own personal psyches, but I, I think when you when you go in with somebody you know, you might have expectations that are uh, either even unspoken, you may not even be aware of them. And so uh, sometimes that can lead to greater conflict than, than actually going in with someone you don't know and you have to explain yourself to, you know, this is how I prefer to go to sleep or this is how I like my, my things not to be touched or to be shared or whatever the case may be. So, sometimes the work inherent in getting to know someone is an important ingredient in uh, roommate relations. It's definitely. Well, as we wait for any additional questions, is there any words of wisdom or advice that each of you would share for family members of how they can support their student as they join our community. And it can either be in reference to your functional area or just in general advice that either you've learned through your own experience um, or things that you've seen that have been helpful for um, families that you've reflected with. I'd go. Um, I have to say that I worked for years in talking to parents about the meaning of um, them starting college. And then my own kids went to college. And what I learned from that experience really taught me a lot about how easy it is to give advice and how hard it is to take your own advice. Um, having said that, I will say that part of what you know is about to happen is that your student is about to begin begin a journey that um, is going to have that is transformational, but it's not transformational the minute it starts. And they will be trying to figure out how to be how to be in this new relationship with themselves as much as you're also going to be having to figure out what it's like to sort of support them in their new, uh, their new endeavor, but also um, make sure you're asking the questions that you're still interested in finding out. And I, I would just say to be patient with yourself, to be patient with the process and, and to know that, um, you know, they might right now be in the habit of texting you constantly and calling you constantly, and that might change. They may un, uh, they may decide that, you know, because it's painful to be away from home or because they're trying to figure out sort of who they are in this new space that um, that that it's that things might be different. And I, I I'm going to mess up this. Winnie the Pooh quote, but there's something, there's some quote that I love where he says, how wonderful it is to have somebody um, that makes saying goodbye so difficult. And we're not really saying goodbye, but we are saying goodbye to a certain phase in our lives and, and we're entering a new one. And so I hope that you can enjoy all the love and, and challenges you've had up to this point and just eventually be able to look forward to um, what this new uh, era will bring. And I, I really do wish you all the best of luck. And we're here to support them and to support you as well, if you have any questions. My goodness, it's hard to follow up from that Winnie the Pooh quote, because that's a personal favorite as well. Um, but I do want to be thoughtful of everyone's time. Um, I want to extend extreme gratitude again to our three panelists, our campus experts. They will be interacting with your students. Um, their teams will be interacting with your students. Uh, but please know, as we we mentioned in advance or pr previously, that um, that you know if you have questions, reach out to us. We're happy to continue the conversation and um, ensure that you have information and resources to support your student as well. Uh, if you have questions, I did want to go ahead and share my screen one more time, just so that way 
um, you have that um, our quick contact information. Um, so please feel free to take a picture of that. Um, so that way you can um, reach out to us as needed. And again, when in doubt, you are welcome to reach out to orientation at bentley.edu. So thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you at some future events. And uh, thank you again. Take care. Okay, bye. See you soon.